Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Required Reading. My name is Russ, as always. I am uh, super happy to be here with you guys. We are going to do a little bit more reading today, which is always something I love. Uh, the last time I was here, we did a, well, excuse me, we performed a reading of the novelization of the classic movie Alien. Uh, and so in that last episode, we were introduced to the characters and they uh, woke up on the ship. They didn't know why they were waking up. And we found out a little bit more information about the crewmates and their stations on the ship Nostromo. Uh, and I think we, we left off with the, uh, the repair guys uh, talking back and forth. So... Without further ado, let's jump right into Chapter 2 of Alien, the official movie novelization. Feel free to follow along uh, in the reader box uh, to my right. Uh, I'll try and keep that updated as much as I can. There's a little bit of a discrepancy between what I'm reading off of and what you're seeing there, so please bear with me if uh, I read ahead uh, a little bit further. I'll try and keep track of it, okay? All right, so here we go, chapter two. Though far from comfortable, the mess was just large enough to hold the entire crew. Since they rarely ate their meals simultaneously, the always functional auto chef indirectly encouraging individuality in eating habits, it hadn't been designed with comfortable seating for seven in mind. They shuffled from foot to foot, bumping and jostling each other and trying not to get on each other's nerves. Parker and Brett weren't happy and took no pains to hide their displeasure. Their sole consolation was the knowledge that nothing was wrong with engineering and that whatever they'd been re revived to deal with was the responsibility of persons other than themselves. Ripley had already filled them in on the disconcerting absence of their intended destination. Parker considered that they would all have to re-enter hypersleep, a messy and uncomfortable process at its best, <clears throat> and cursed under his breath. He resented anything that kept him separated from his end-of-voyage paycheck. We know we haven't arrived at Seoul, Captain, Kane spoke for the others, who were all eyeing Dallas expectantly. We're nowhere near home, and the ship has still seen fit to hustle us all out of hypersleep. Time we found out why. Time you did, Dallas agreed readily. As you all know, he began importantly, Mother is programmed to interrupt our journey and bring us out of hyperdrive and sleep if certain specified conditions arise. He paused for effect, said, They have. It would have to be a pretty ser it would have to be pretty serious, Lambert was watching Jones the cat play with a blinking telltale. You know that. Bring a full crew out of hypersleep, it isn't lightly done. There's always some risk involved. Tell me about it, Parker muttered it so softly only Brett could hear. You'll all be happy to learn, Dallas continued, that the emergency we've been awakened to deal with does not involve the Nostromo. Mother says we're in perfect shape. A couple of heartfelt amens sounded in the cramped mess. The emergency lies elsewhere, specifically in the unlisted system we've recently entered. We should be closing on the particular planet concerned right now. He glanced at Ash, who rewarded him with a confirming nod. We picked up a transmission from another source. It's garbled and apparently took Mother some time to puzzle out, but it's definitely a distress signal. Whoa, that doesn't make sense. Lambert looked puzzled herself. Of all standard transmissions, emergency calls are the most straightforward and least complex. Why would Mother have the slightest trouble in interpreting one? 
Mother speculates that this is anything but a standard transmission. It's an acoustic beacon signal, which repeats at intervals of 12 seconds. That much isn't unusual. However, she believes this signal is not of human origin. That provoked some startled muttering. When the first excitement had faded, he explained further. Mother's not positive. That's what I don't understand. I've never seen a computer show confusion before. Ignorance, yes, but not confusion. This may be a first. What is important is that she's certain enough it's a distress signal to pull us out of hypersleep. So what? Brett appeared sublimely unconcerned. Kane replied with just a hint of irritation. Come on, man, you know your manual. We're obliged under Section B-2 of Company In-Transit Directives to render whatever aid and assistance we can in such situations, whether the call is human or otherwise. Parker kicked at the deck in disgust. Christ, I hate to say this, but we're a commercial tug with a big, hard-to-handle cargo, not a damn rescue unit. This kind of duty's not in our... Contract. He brightened slightly. Of course, if there's some extra money involved for such work. You'd better read your own contract, Ash recited as neatly as the main computer he was so proud of. Any systematic transmission indicating possible intelligent origin must be investigated. At penalty of full forfeiture of all pay and bonuses due on journey's completion. Not a word about bonus money for helping someone in distress. Parker gave the deck another kick, kept his mouth shut. Neither he nor Brett considered themselves the hero type. Anything that could force a ship down on a strange world might treat them in an equally inconsiderate manner. Not that they had any evidence that this unknown caller had been forced down, but being a realist in a harsh universe, he was inclined to be pessimistic. Brett simply saw the detour in terms of his delayed paycheck. We're going in. That's all there is to it. Dallas eyed each in turn. He was about fed up with the two of them. He no more enjoyed this kind of detour than they did, and was as anxious to be home and offloading their cargo as they were, but there were times when letting off steam crossed over into disobedience. Right, said Brett, sardonically. Right what? The engineering tech was no fool. The combination of Dallas's tone combined with the expression on his face told Brett it was time to ease up. Right, we're going in. Dallas continued to stare at him, and he added with a smile, Sir. The captain turned a jaundiced eye on Parker, but that worthy was now subdued. Can we land on it? he asked Ash. Somebody did. That's what I mean, he said significantly. Land is a benign term. It implies a sequence of events successfully carried out, resulting in the gentle and safe touchdown of a ship on a hard surface. We're faced with a distress call. That implies events other than benign. Let's go find out what's going on. But let's go quietly, with boots in hand. There was an illuminated cartographic table on the bridge. Dallas, Kane, Ripley, and Ash stood at opposite points of its compass while Lambert sat at her station. The... Well, if you will please excuse me, folks, I will be back in just a little bit. folks sorry about that uh, little interruption uh, we run a business from home and uh, business don't stop for book reading 
Uh, so here we are. We're going to go ahead and, and jump right back into it. Uh, again, please pardon my uh, life interrupting on art. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, there it is. Dallas fingered a glowing point on the table. He looked around the table. Something I want everyone to hear. They resumed their seats as he nodded to Lambert. Her fingers were poised over a particular switch. Okay, let's hear it. Watch the volume. The navigator flipped the switch. Static and hissing sounds filled the bridge. These cleared suddenly, were replaced by a sound that sent shivers up Kane's back and unholy crawling things down Ripley's. It lasted for twelve seconds, then was replaced by the static. Good God! Kane's expression was drawn. Lambert switched off the speakers. It was human on the bridge again. What the hell is that? Ripley looked as though she'd just seen something dead on her lunch plate. It doesn't sound like any distress signal I've ever heard. That's what Mother calls it, Dallas told them. Calling it alien turns out to have been something of an understatement. Maybe it's a voice. Lambert paused, considered her just uttered words, found the implications they raised unpleasant, and tried to pretend she hadn't said them. Well, we'll know soon. Have you homed in on it? I found the section of the planet. Lambert turned gratefully to her console, relieved to be able to deal with the mathematics instead of disquieting thoughts. We're close enough. Mother wouldn't have pulled us out of hypersleep unless we were... Excuse me. Mother wouldn't have pulled us out of hypersleep unless we were, Ripley mu mu murmured. It's coming from Ascension 6 minutes, 20 seconds, declination minus 39 degrees, 2 seconds. Show me the whole thing on a screen. The navigator hit a succession of buttons. One of the bridge view screens flickered, gifted them with a bright dot. Hi, Albedo. Can you get in a little closer? And we're going to switch our pages here. No, you have to look at it from this distance. That's what I'm going to do. Immediately, the screen zoomed in tighter on the pinpoint of light, revealing an unspectacular, slightly oblate shape sitting in the emptiness. Smartass. Dallas voiced it without malice. You sure that's it? It's a crowded system. That's it, all right. Just a planetoid, really. Maybe 1,200 kilometers, no more. Any rotation? Yeah, about two hours, working off the initial figures. Tell you better in ten minutes. That's good enough for now. What's the gravity? Lambert studied different readouts. 0.86 must be pretty dense stuff. Don't tell Parker and Brett, said Ripley. They'll be thinking it's solid, heavy metal and wander off somewhere prospecting before we can check out our unknown broadcaster. Ash's observation was more prosaic. You can walk on it. They settled down to working on orbiting procedure. The Nostromo edged close to the tiny world, trailing its vast cargo of tanks and refinery equipment. Approaching orbital apogee, mark 20 seconds, 19, 18. Lambert continued to count down while her mates worked steadily around her. Roll 92 degrees starboard. Roll 90. Roll 92 degrees starboard, ya, yeah, announced Kane through thoroughly businesslike. The tug and refinery rotated, performing a massive pirouette in the vastness of space. Light appeared at the stern of the tug as her secondary engines fired briefly. Equator Equatorial orbit nailed, declared Ash. Below them, the miniature world rotated unconcernedly. Give me an EC pressure reading. Ash examined gauges, spoke without turning to face Dallas. 3.45 in slashem squared. About 5 PSIA, sir. Shout if it changes. You worried about redundancy management disabling CMGS controls when we're busy elsewhere? Yeah. CMG control is inhibited via DAS DCS. We'll augment with tax and monitor through ATM DC and computer interface. Feel better now? A lot. 
Ash was a funny sort, kind of coldly friendly but supremely competent. Nothing rattled him. Dallas felt confident with the science officer backing him up, watching his decisions. Prepare to disengage from platform, he flipped a switch, addressed a small pickup. Engineering preparing to disengage. L alignment on port and starboard is green, reported Parker, all hint of usual sarcasm absent. Green on spinal umbilicus severance, added Brett. Crossing the Terminator, Lambert informed them all, entering Nightside. Below, a dark line split thick clouds, leaving them brightly reflecting on one side, dark as the inside of a grave on the other. It's coming up. It's coming up. Stand by. Lambert threw switches in sequence. Stand by. Fifteen seconds. Ten. Five. Four, three, two, one. Lock. Disengage, ordered Dallas curtly. Tiny puffs of gas showed between the Nostromo and the ponderous coasting bulk of the refinery platform. The two artificial structures, one tiny and inhabited, the other enormous and deserted, drifted slowly apart. Dallas watched the separation intently on number two screen. Umbilicus clear, Ripley announced after a short pause. Precision corrected. Kane leaned back in his seat, relaxing for a few seconds. All clean and clear. Separation successful, no damage. Check here, added Lambert. And here, said a relieved Ripley. Dallas glanced over at his navigator. You sure we've left her in the steady orbit? I don't want the whole two billion tons dropping and burning up while we're poking around downstairs. Atmosphere is not thick enough to give us a safe umbrella. Lambert checked the readout. She'll stay up here for a year or so easy, sir. All right. The money's safe and so's our skulls. Let's take it down. Prepare for atmospheric flight. Five humans worked busily, each secure in his or her assigned task. Jones, the cat, sat on a port console and studied the approaching clouds. Dropping, Lambert's attention was fixed on one particular gauge. Fifteen thousand meters, down, down, forty-nine thousand, entering atmosphere. Dallas watched his own instrumentation, tried to evaluate and memorize the dozens of steadily shifting figures. Deep space travel was a question of paying proper homage to one's instruments and letting Mother do the hard work. Atmospheric flight was another story entirely. For a change, it was pilot's work instead of a machine's. Brown and gray clouds kissed the underside of the ship. Watch it. it. Looks nasty down there. How like Dallas, Ripley thought. Somewhere in the dun-hued hell below another ship was bleeding a regular inhuman frightening distress call. The world itself was unlisted which meant they'd begin from scratch where such matters as atmospheric peculiarities, terrain, and such were concerned. Yet to Dallas, it was no more or less than nasty. She'd often wondered what a man as competent as their captain was doing squiring an unimportant tub like the Nostromo around the cosmos. The answer, could she have read his mind, would have surprised her. He liked it. Vertical descent... Computed and entered, correcting course slightly, Lambert informed them. On course now, homing, locked, and we're heading in straight. Check. How's our plotting going to square with secondary propulsion in this weather? We're doing okay so far, sir. I can't say for sure until we get under these clouds if we can get underneath them. Good enough, he frowned at a readout, touched a button. The reading changed to a more pleasing one. Let me know if you think we're going to lose it. Will do. The tug struck an invisibility. Invisible to the eye, not to her instruments. She bounced once, twice, a third time, then settled more comfortably into the thick wad of dark cloud. The ease of the entry was a tribute to Lambert's skills in plotting and Dallas's as a pilot. It did not last. Within the ocean of air, heavy currents swirled. They began buffeting the descending ship. Turbulence, Ripley wrestled with her own controls. Give us navigation and landing lights, Dallas tried to sort scents from the maelstrom obscuring the viewscreen. Maybe we can spot something visually. 
No substitute for the instruments, said Ash. Not in this. No substitute for maximum input either. Anyhow, I like to look. Powerful lights came on beneath the Nostromo. They pierced the cloud waves only weakly and did not provide the clear field of vision Dallas had so badly desired. But they did illuminate the dark screens, thereby lightening both the bridge and the mental atmosphere thereon. Lambert felt less like they were flying through ink. Parker and Brett couldn't see the cloud cover outside, but they could feel it. The engine room gave a sudden shift, rocked to the opposite side, shifted sharply again. Parker swore under his breath. What was that? You hear that? Yeah. Brett examined a readout nervously. Pressure drop in intake number three. Must have lost a shield. He punched buttons. Yep, three's gone. Dust pouring through the intake. Shut her down. Shut her down. What do you think I'm doing? Great. So we've got a secondary full of dust. No problem. I hope. Brett adjusted a control. I'll bypass number three, vent the stuff back out as it comes in. Damage is done, though. Parker didn't like to think what the presence of windblown abrasives might have done to the intake lining. What the hell are we flying through? Clouds or rocks? If we don't crash, dollars to your aunt's cherry, we get an electrical fire somewhere in the relevant circuitry. Unaware of the steady cursing taking place in engineering, the five on the bridge went about the business of trying to set the tug down intact and clear the signal source. Slowing and turning, Dallas leaned over on a manual helm. Correct course three degrees, four minutes right. He complied with the directions. That's got it. Five kilometers to center of, e of search circle and steady. Tightening now, Dallas fingered the helm once more. Three kilos, two, Lambert sounded just a mite excited, though whether from the danger or the nearness of the signal source, Dallas couldn't tell. We're practically circling above it now. Nice work, Lambert. Ripley, what's the terrain like? Finding us a landing spot? Working, sir. She tried several panels, her expression of disgust growing deeper as unacceptable readings came back. Dallas continued to make sure the ship held its target in the center of the circling flight path, while Ripley fought to make sense of the unseen surface. Visual line of sight impossible. We can see that, Kane mumbled, or rather can't see it. The rare half-glimpses the instruments had given him of the ground hadn't put him in a pleasant frame of mind. The occasional readings had hinted at extensive desolation, a hostile, barren desert of world. Radar gives me noise. Ripley wished electronics could react to imprecations as readily as people. Sonar gives me noise, infrared noise. Hang on, I'm gonna try ultraviolet. Spectrum's high enough not to interfere. A moment followed by the appearance of a crucial readout of some gratifying lines at last, followed in turn by brightly lit words and a computer sketch. That did it. And a place to land on? Ripley looked fully relaxed now. As near as I can tell, we can set down anywhere you like. Readings say it's flat below us. Totally flat. Dallas's thoughts turned to visions of smooth lava of a cool but deceptively thin crust barely concealing molten destruction. Yeah, but flat what? Water? Peho ho? Sand? Bounce something off Kane. Get us a determination. I'll take her down low enough so that we can lose most of this interference. If it's flat, I can get us close enough to, without much trouble. Kane flipped switches. Monitoring analytics activated. Still getting noise. Carefully, Dallas eased the tug towards the surface. Still noisy, but starting to clear. Again, Dallas lost altitude. Lambert watched gauges. They were more than high enough for a safe clearance, but at the speed they were traveling, they could change, it could change rapidly if anything went wrong with the ship's engines, or if an otherworldly downdraft should materialize. Nor could they cut their speed further. In this wind, that would mean a critical loss of control. 
Clearing, clearing. Right, that's got it. He studied the readouts and contour lines provided by the ship's imaging scanner. It was molten once, but not anymore. Not for a long time, according to analytics. It's mostly basalt, some rhyolite, rhyolit with occasional lava overlays. Everything's cool and solid now. No sign of tectonic activity. He utilized other instruments to probe deeper into the secrets of the tiny world skin. No faults of consequence below us or in the immediate vicinity. Should be a nice place to sit down. Dallas thought briefly. You're positive about that surface composition? It's too old to be anything else. The executive officer sounded a touch peeved. I know enough to check an age data along with the composition. Think I'd take any chances putting us down inside a volcano? All right, all right. Sorry, just checking. I haven't done a landing without charts and beacons since school training. I'm a bit nervous. Ain't we all, admitted Lambert readily. If we're set then, no one objected. Let's take her down. I'm going to spiral in as best as I can in this wind, try and get us as close as possible. But keep a tight signal watch on, Lambert. I don't want us coming down on top of that calling ship. Warn me for distance if we get too close. His tone was intense in the cramped room. Adjustments were made, commands given, and executed by faithful electronic servants. The Nostromo commenced to follow a steady spiraling path surfaceward, fighting crosswinds and protesting gusts of black air every meter of the way. Fifteen kilometers in descending, announced Ripley evenly. Twelve, ten, eight. Dallas touched a control, slowing rate. Slowing rate, five, three, two, one kilometer. The same control was further altered. Slowing. Activate landing engines. Locked. Kane was working confidently at his console. Descent now, computer monitored. A crisp, loud hum filled the bridge as Mother took over the controls of their drop, regulating the last meters of the descent with more precision than the best human pilot could have managed. Descending on landers, Kane told them. Kill engines. Dallas performed a final pre-landing check, flipped several switches to off. Engines off, lifter quads functioning properly. A steady throbbing filled the bridge. 900 meters and dropping, Ripley watched her console. 800, 700, 6. She continued to count off the rate of descent in hundreds of meters. Before long, she was reciting it in tens. At 5 meters, the tug hesitated hovering on its landers of the, above the storm-wracked, night-shrouded surface. Struts down! Kane was already moving to execute the required action as Dallas was giving the order. A faint whine filled the bridge. Several thick metal legs unfolded beetle-like from the ship's belly, drifted tantalizingly close to the still unseen rock below. Four meters. Ugh! Ripley stopped. So did the Nostromo, as landing struts contacted unyielding rock. Massive absorbers cushioned the contact. We're down. Something snapped. A minor circuit, probably, or perhaps an overload not properly compensated for, not handled fast enough. A terrific shock ran through the ship. The metal of the hull vibrated, producing an eerie metallic moan throughout the ship. Lost it! Lost it! Kane was shouting as the lights on the bridge went out. Gages screamed for attention as the failure snowballed back through the interdependent metal nerve ends of the Nostromo. When the shock struck engineering, Parker and Brett were preparing to crack another set of beers. A line of ranked pipes set into the molded ceiling promptly exploded. Three panels in the control cubicle burst into flames, while a nearby pressure valve swelled then burst. The lights went out, and they fumbled for hand beams while Parker tried to find the button controlling the backup generator, which provided power in the absence of direct service from the operating engines.
Controlled confusion reigned on the bridge. When the yells and questions had died down, it was Lambert who voiced the most common thought. Secondary generator should have kicked over by now. She took a step, bumped a knee hard against the console. Wonder what's keeping it? Kane moved to the wall, felt along it, back up landing controls. Here. He ran his fingers over several familiar knobs. Aft lock stud. There. Nearby ought to be. His hand fastened on an emergency light bar. Switched it on, a dim glow revealed several ghostly silhouettes. With Kane's light serving as a guide, Dallas and Lambert located their own light bars. The three beams combined to provide enough illumination to work by. What happened? Why hasn't the secondary taken over? And what caused the outage? Ripley thumbed the intercom. Engine room, what happened? What's our status? Lousy. Parker sounded busy, mad, and worried all at once. A distant buzzing, like the frantic wings of some colossal insect, formed a backdrop to his words. Those words rose and faded as though the speaker were having trouble staying in range of the omnidirectional intercom pickup. Goddamn dust in the engine, that's what happened. Caught it coming down. Guess we didn't get to close it off and clean it out in time. Got an electrical fire back here. It's big, was Brett's single addition to the conversation. He sounded weak with distance. And let's see. There we go. Okay. There was a pause during which they could make out only the whoosh of chemical extinguishers over the speakers. The intakes got clogged. Brett finally was able to tell the anxious knot of listeners. We overheated bad, burn out, whole cell, I think. Christ, it's really breaking loose down here. Dallas glanced over at Ripley. Those two sound busy enough. Somebody give me the critical answer. Something went bang. I hope to hell it wasn't... Excuse me. I hope to hell it was only back in their department, but it could be worse. Has the hole been breached? It took a deep breath. If so, where and how badly? Ripley performed a quick scan of the ship's emergency pressurization gauges, then made a rapid eye search via individual cabin diagrams before she felt confident in replying with certainty. I don't see anything. We still have full pressure in all compartments. If there's a hole, it's too small to show, and the self-seals already managed to plug it. Ash studied his own console, along with the others. It was independently powered in the event of a massive energy failure such as they were presently experiencing. Air and all compartments shows no signs of contamination from outside atmosphere. I think we're still tight, sir. Best news I've seen in 60 seconds. Kane hit the exterior screens that are still... Kane hit the exterior screens that are still powered up. The executive officer adjusted a trio of toggles. There was a noticeable flickering, hints of faint geological forms, then complete darkness. Nothing. We're blind outside as well as in here. Have to get secondary power at least before we can have a look at where we are. Batteries aren't enough even for minimal imaging. The audio sensors required less energy. They conveyed the voice of this world into the cabin. The storm wind sound rose and fell against the motionless receptors, filling the bridge with a hoo click that sounded like fish arguing. Wish we'd come down at daylight, Lambert gazed out the dark port. We'd be able to see without instruments. What's the matter, Lambert? Kane was teasing her. Afraid of the dark? She didn't smile back. I'm not afraid of the dark. I, I, I'm not afraid of the dark I know. It's the dark that I don't that terrifies me. Especially when it's filled with noises like that distress call. She turned her attention back to the dust-swept port. Her willingness to express their deepest fears did nothing to improve the mental atmosphere of the bridge. Cramped at the best of times, it grew suffocating in the near blackness, made worse by a continuing silence among them. It was a relief when Ripley announced, We've got intercom to engineering again. Dallas and the others watched her expectantly as she fiddled with the amp. That you, Parker? Yeah, it's me. From the sound of it, the engineer was too tired to snap in his usual acerbic manner. What's your status? Dallas crossed his mental fingers. What about the fire? 
We finally got it knocked down. He sighed, making it sound like the wind over the calm. Got into some of the old lubrication lining in the corridor walls down on sea level. For a while, I thought we'd get our lungs seared proper. The combustible stuff was thinner than I thought, though. It burned out fast before it ate too much of her air. Scrubbers seemed to be getting the carbon out okay. Dallas licked his lips. How about the damage? Never mind the superficial stuff. Ship efficiency function and performance hindrance are all I'm concerned about. I see. Four panels totally shot. Dallas could imagine the engineer ticking off items on his fingers as he reported back. Secondary load sharing unit is out, and at least three cellites on 12 module are gone. With all that, implies... He let that sink in, added. You want the little things? Give me about an hour, I'll have your list. Skip it. Hold on a second. He turned to Ripley. Try the screens again. She did so with no effect. They remained as blank as a company accountant's mind. Well, we'll just have to do without a while longer, he told her. You sure that's everything? She said into the pickup. Ripley found herself feeling sympathy for Parker and Brett for the first time since they'd become a part of the crew. Or since she had, as Parker preceded her in seniority as a member of the Nostromo's complement. So far, <coughs> try to get a full ship power back right now 12 module going out oh excuse me 12 module going out screwed up everything back here let you know about power when we're gone through everything that fire ate what about repairs can you manage Dallas was running over the engineers brief report in his mind they ought to be able to patch up the initial damage but the cellite problem would take time what might be wrong with Module 12 he preferred not to think about. Couldn't fix it all out here no matter what, Parker replied. I didn't think you could. Don't expect you to. What can you do? We need to reroute a couple of these ducks and realign the damage intakes. We'll have to work around the, around the really bad damage. Can't fix those ducks properly without putting the ship in full dry dock. We'll have to fake it. I understand. What else? Told you. Module 12. I'm giving it to you straight. We lost the main cell. How? The dust? Partly. Parker paused, exchanged inaudible words with Brett, then was back at the pickup. Some fragments augmented inside the intakes caked up and caused the overheating that sparked the fire. You know how sensitive those drivers are? Went right through the shielding and blew up the whole system. Anything you can do with it? Dallas asked. The system had to be repaired somehow. They couldn't replace it. I think so. Brett thinks so. We gotta clean it all out and revacuum, then see how well it holds. If it stays tight after it's been scoured, we should be fine. If it doesn't, we can try metal forming a patch seal. If it turns out that we got a crack running through the length of the duck, well... His voice trailed away. Let's not talk about ultimate problems. Dallas suggested. Let's stick with the immediate ones for now and hope they're all we have to deal with. Okay, by us. Right. Right, added Brett, sounding as though he was working somewhere off to the engineering's left. Bridge out. Engineering out. Keep the coffee warm. Ripley flipped off the intercom, looked expectantly at Dallas. He sat quietly, thinking. How long before we're functional, Ripley? Given that Parker's right about the damage and that he and Brett can do their jobs and the repairs hold. She studied readouts, thought for a moment. If they can reroute those ducks and fix Module 12 to the point where it'll carry its share of the power load again, I'd estimate 15 to 20 hours. Not too bad. I got 18. He didn't smile, but he was feeling more hopeful. What about the auxiliaries? They better be ready to go when we get power back. Working on it, Lambert made adjustments to, con to the concealed instrumentation. We'll be ready here when they finished back in engineering. Ten minutes later, a tiny speaker at Kane's station let go with a series of sharp beeps. He studied a gauge, then flipped on the comm. Bridge, Kane here. 
Sounding exhausted but pleased with himself, Parker spoke from the far end of the ship. I don't know how long it'll hold. Some of the welds we had to make are pretty sloppy. If everything kicks over the way we ought to, it, the way it ought to, we'll retrace more carefully and redo the seals for permanence. You ought to have power now. The exec thumbed an override. Lights returned to the bridge. Dependent readouts flickered and lit up, and there were scattered grunts and murmurs of appreciation from the rest of the crew. We've got power and lights back, Gain reported. Nice work, you two. Oh, all our work is nice, replied Parker. Right. Brett must have been standing next to the intercom pickup, back by the engines, judging from the steady hum that formed an elegant counterpoint to his standard monosyllabic, monosyllabic uh, response. Excuse me. Coming close here. Wow. Ooh, way behind on this reader. I am sorry, guys. Don't get too excited, Parker was saying. The new ling should hold. But I'm not making any promises. We just threw stuff together back here. Anything new up your way? Kane shook his head, reminded himself that Parker couldn't see the gesture. Not a damn thing, he glanced out the nearest port. The bridge, the bridge lights cast their faint glow over a patch of featureless barren ground. Occasionally, the storm raging outside would carry a large fragment of sand or bit of rock into view, and there would be a brief flash produced by reflection, but that was all. Just bare rock. I can't see very far. For all I know, we could be squatting five meters from the local oasis. Dream on. Parker shouted something to Brett, closed with the workman like, be in touch if we have any trouble, let us know the same. Send you a postcard. Kane switched off. All right, my friends. Uh, you wonderful bookworms. Uh, that is uh, the end of chapter two, and that is going to be the end of the episode today. Uh, something I wanted to point out while we were reading this. Uh, you know, we didn't really talk about it. Um, last time, I don't believe, and something that I thought was really kind of neat, uh, you know, beyond, uh, at the beginning of the last chapter, they talked about how there are professional dreamers who, uh, share their dreams with audiences as a, like, form of entertainment or television. Uh, they talked about it for, like, the first couple of pages of the book. And then uh, later on, you know, we talk about uh, the fact that, you know, they, the crude oil, uh, you know, fossil fuels and things that they can make plastics out of uh, have been tapped dry in, uh, you know, at Earth. And so now they have to go out into the far reaches of explored space to find other uh, sources of fossil fuels, petroleum, so on and so forth, so that they can make these plastics. Um, and then that is the reason why the Nostromo is out there is that it goes out and it collects these raw materials and then it's got a refinery built into it so that it can take these raw materials and, and turn them into you know the petroleum and so on and so forth that they're uh, looking to make their plastics with and I just think that was really interesting I'm probably totally oblivious I'm sure you know that's something that's in the movie that I just missed but it's never like you know when you're reading it like this you know you really pay attention to it and uh, so it becomes like much more apparent that this is like you know this is like just, it's like space truckers you know uh, if you ever see that that movie with Dennis Hopper uh, it's a beautiful movie. Uh, the the protagonist in that movie, I think, was actually he was the antagonist in Blade, uh, the first you know Blade movie. But it's just about these guys that are they're transporting stuff through through you know space or through outer space. So anyway, I, it just reminds me of that, which I think is funny, you know, because it's two different sides of the spectrum with a with a connecting line of uh, relevant content, which is that these guys are basically just transporting things from one place to another, goods and services, and so they they really are like just these blue collared people, you know, out in space. So anyway, that that was just something that I picked up on as we were reading. I am severely enjoying this. This is uh, it's just so fantastic that uh, you know we get 
uh, again, like it's it's like a haunted house in space. You know, it's it's, it's a spook house in space, which is always so cool. So, well, uh, with all of that said, please feel free to join me again uh, for required reading when we do chapter three. That'll be sometime next week. Maybe one of these days I'll actually get around to scheduling something instead of just arbitrarily <laughs> uh, arbitrarily turning this on. Uh, but of course, the reruns are here on Twitch. Uh, the reruns are also available on YouTube, uh, which we are Center Centerville Local Access Channel 42, which you can find us on YouTube there. You can also find us on Instagram. Uh, that is Russ underscore does underscore stuff. And we are also on TikTok. So please feel free to seek us out in any of those locations. Feel free to stop by and say hi. We always love the encouragement. But in the meantime, my friends, keep reading and uh, be good to one another. Bye.